Um, so now we're going to move on to um, the main event for tonight. I think I booked Sinan more than a year ago, and I've been pestering him mercilessly ever since. <laughs> he can attest to this. Um, so I found my way to his poetry through his translations. He's a beautiful translator, and he has, I think, a very rare gift, which is that he's able to move in both directions. In, he can go from Arabic to English and also from English to Arabic. And if anybody's done any translating, that is really, really hard to do. And um, so I, I admired him for that, and I started to do some research about him, and I discovered his, po his poems online. And I, I really fell hard for those. And then I, I picked up one of his novels, which is called The Corpse Washer. And, um, and it, it's a devastating novel, um, but it's also so beautifully written that um, I, I wrote in my notes that I think people call his fiction novels, but they're really poems masquerading as novels. And so for poets, it's delicious reading. It's, it's tough subject matter, but it's beautifully, beautifully rendered. Um, and so then I decided I had to have him come and read. And, um, and usually we invite two poets to read for an event, but I wanted to hear from Sinan the poet and Sinan the novelist and also Sinan the translator. And so there really was only going to be enough time for the, this one person. Um, and so he's going to, um, at my constant prodding, also read some of his work in Arabic. Um, which I'm hungry to hear. I think it's a beautiful language, and we don't hear very much of it um, in our country. Um, so I'm going to read his official bio also. I, I truncated it greatly because he's an extremely accomplished person, um, but it goes something like this. Uh, Sinan Antun is a poet, novelist, scholar, and translator. He holds degrees from Baghdad, Georgetown, and Harvard, where he earned a doctorate in Arabic literature. He has published two collections of poetry and four novels. His works have been translated into nine languages. In 2003, he returned to his native Baghdad to co-direct About Baghdad, a documentary about life under occupation. He is currently an associate professor at NYU. Please welcome me, or join, sorry, join me. I'm so nervous. <laughs> when you really love someone's work, it's so nerve-wracking to introduce them. But please join me in welcoming Sinan Antun. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Francesca, for the invitation, for the wonderful introduction, and for your patience with, with me over email. I'm, I'm really um, horrible. Thank you all for coming. I'm really delighted to be here. And as Francesca requested, um, I will read a few of my translations and then move to um, the poetry and the prose. I will start with... Um, a few poems by a poet I've been working on for the last few years, whose name is Sargon Bolus, and who's actually has something to do with the Bay Area because he left Iraq to Beirut in 1967, and then later he moved and lived in San Francisco for a very long time um, and wrote a lot of his poems. He died in 2008, unfortunately. But I've been translating a lot of his poetry from Arabic into English, so I'll read a few. Uh, this one is called A Pebble. The day after the flood, a stagnant morning. There is a tear at the bottom of the world, frozen like an orphan pebble. The hurricane obliterates everything, palm trees, houses, boats, bicycles, and minarets. But this pebble stays right there, glistening faintly because the hand of eternity has polished its bald head, just like the Lord's shoeshine. There it is under your foot. Step on it if you wish. Step hard, then cross over. Fear not, among pebbles it is no more than a pebble. The next one is called Eve's House. When I am lost, her eyes guide me from below. The silence in her house is deeper than a forest. The world around us is a sea. Humans have not been created. Sorry. 
Humans have not been created. There is a nocturnal bird in the garden. Its monotonous singing accompanies our descent from one abyss to the next. Um, next, I want to read from um, a poet I've translated a lot, the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, and particularly the book In the Presence of Absence, which is his last uh, prose book, but it's more prose poetry, in that he was told by the doctors that he did not have long to live, so he wrote a extended self-elegy in which he elegized himself, but it's also what I call not a, an autobiography, but a poetography, because he it's looking back at how one becomes a poet and what it means um, to become a poet. So I'll read two excerpts from that. Be a child again. Teach me poetry. Teach me the rhythm of the sea. Return towards their initial innocence. Give birth to me from a grain of wheat, not from a wound. Give birth to me and take me back to a world before meaning so I can embrace you on the grass. Do you hear me? A world before meaning. The tall trees walked with us as trees, not as meaning. The naked moon crawled with us, a moon, not a silver platter for meaning. Be a child again. Teach me poetry. Teach me the rhythm of the sea. Take my hand so we can cross this threshold between night and day together. Together we will learn the first words and we'll build a secret nest for the sparrow, our third sibling. Be a child again so I can see my face in your mirror. Are you I? Am I you? Teach me poetry so I can elegize you now, now, just as you elegize me. Uh, the second excerpt is about longing. Longing is a scar inside the heart and a country's fingerprint on the body. But no one longs for his wound. No one longs for pain or nightmare, but for what was before. For a time when there was no pain except of primary pleasures that melt time, like a sugar cube in a cup of tea and for a time of heavenly images. Longing is the call of nigh to nigh to restore the direction broken by the horse's hooves in a military campaign. It is an intermittent ailment, neither contagious nor lethal, even when it takes the form of an epidemic. It is an invitation to stay up late with the lonesome and an excuse not to be on equal footing with train passengers who know their own address as well. It is that transparent fabric of that beautiful nothingness, gathered to roast the coffee of wakefulness for the dreams of strangers. It rarely comes in the morning, and it rarely interferes in a passing conversation with a taxi driver, intrudes in a conference hall, or on the first date between a man and a woman. It is the evening guest arriving when you look for your own traces in what is around you and cannot find them. When a sparrow perches on the balcony and seems to be a message from a country you did not love when you were in it, as you love it now that it is in you. It was granted a tree, a rock. It became the address of a soul and an idea, an ember and language. It was air, earth and water, and it became a poem. Longing is the groaning of right when incapable of providing proof of the might of right before the might of oppression. The groaning of homes buried beneath settlements that the absent bequeathed to the absent and the present to the absent with the first drop of milk in exile and in refugee camps. Longing is the sound of silk rising in mutual groaning from the mulberry to the one longing for it. It is the convergence of conscious and unconscious instinct. It is lost time protesting the sadism of the present. Longing is an ache that does not long to ache. It is the aching stirred by pure air coming from a distant mountaintop. 
the ache of searching for a past happiness. But it is a healthy kind of ache because it reminds us that we are afflicted with hope and are sentimental. And next, I guess, Sinan the novelist will read uh, <laughs> from The Corpse Washer, uh, which is about a boy who is born into a family of uh, traditional corpse washer, people whose profession is to tend to the corpses of the dead according to Islamic rituals and bid them farewell. The boy um, is very talented and wants to be an artist, so he resists the pressure from his father and from his family and doesn't want to um, carry on with this profession, but history, wars and sanctions in Iraq and dictatorship and everything force him to uh, uh, do this job because it's the only way to make uh, ends meet. So the most of the novel is about his memories, but it's also about the struggle of coming to terms with this and also as a generational conflict and coming to understand these rituals and their importance even though he does not believe in them. So the excerpt I will read is when he remembers how as a young boy he begins to understand or tries to understand what his father's profession is and what, what it means. I stood next to my mother on the steps in front of the big wooden door. Her right hand firmly clasped my right hand, as if I were about to run or fly away. Her left hand carried the sofortas in which she packed my father's lunch, three small copper pots, each stacked on top of the other in a metal skeleton resembling a little metal building. The top pot was filled with rice, the middle one with okra stew and two pieces of meat. The lower pot usually had some fruit. That day she had put in a tiny bunch of white grapes, the kind we call goat nipples, that my father liked. There was a warm loaf of homemade bread in the nylon sack dangling from her left wrist. She put her left foot on the steps and temporarily released my hand to knock four times. Her strong knocks pushed the door open. She pretended not to see the young man squatting a few steps away from the door with his back to the wall. He was wearing black. His head was buried in his hands and he looked like he was wailing. Smoke rose from the cigarette in his left hand. That was the first time I had seen a grown man cry. I looked into my mother's coffee-colored eyes. In a hushed voice, I asked, why is this man crying? She put her index finger on her lips to shush me and whispered, don't be rude, Jawad. I craned to the left, curious to see what was happening inside. It was the first time my mother had taken me to my father's place of work. He usually took the sofortas with him in the morning, but that day he had forgotten to bring it along. The narrow walkway led to a wide room with a high ceiling. Three or four men were standing at its entrance with their backs blocking the scene. Were they watching my father as he worked? The street was quiet, although the walkway was long, I could hear the sound of water being spilled with my father's voice muttering phrases I couldn't understand except for the word, God. My mother knocked at the open door with more force and determination this time, and then called out, Hamoudi. None of the men turned around. Then the one standing to the far left moved aside and Hamoudi's face appeared. He limped to the door. Hamoudi, my father's assistant, looked older than his actual age. He had black hair and eyelashes as thick as a paintbrush. He wore blue shorts and a white t-shirt which was wet in many spots. After exchanging a quick hello, my mother gave him the sofortas and the bread saying, Here, Hamoudi, this is Abu Amuri's lunch. He forgot to take it. He thanked her and rushed back inside after shutting the door. She held my hand again and we started to make our way back home. I turned back to look at the squatting man. His head was still in his hands. My mother shook me and said, mind where you're going, you're going to trip and fall. At that age, I didn't know much about my father's work. All I know was that he was a mghassilchi, a body washer. But this word was obscure to me. I was afraid that day and asked my mother, does father hurt people? No, son, not at all. It's quite the opposite. Why do you ask? But wasn't that man there crying? 
Yes, but not because of your father. He's just sad. Why is he sad? What are they doing inside? Your dad washes the bodies of the dead. It's a very honorable profession, and those who do it are rewarded by God. Why does he wash them? Are they dirty? No, but they must be purified. And where do the dead go after they die? To God. Your father tends to them before they are buried. How can they go to God if they are buried? The soul rises to the sky, but the body remains in the earth it came from. It is said that we are come from Adam, and Adam is of dust. I looked up to the sky. There were five clouds huddled together, and I wondered which one will carry the dead man's soul, and where will it take it? So, moving on to poetry. I will read some new poems from a collection um, underway. Provisional title is A Postcard from the Underworld. Um, the first poem is kind of the identity poem, The Poet, where I spell out what poets should do. I'm just kidding. The Poet. The Poet is another Noah. He spends a lifetime building an ark of words, filling it with metaphors and clouds his solitude amassed, but he makes sure there is enough silence in the skeleton so that water seeps into his poem and it slowly sinks until it rests on the bottom of the sea. A postcard from the underworld. I have never seen the sun. It does not rise here. My father saw it there before his death. He tells me about it all the time, about its burning flames. Like a candle, he said, lit by the gods, never to be extinguished. Like the one I am holding now, here. He taught me how to put these bodies back together, to cover them with feathers so they could roam the darkness. Sometimes an arm or a leg remains. I put it in the corner and wait for the piles they bring the next day. I will ask my father about the eye. He hung on the wall a week ago. It is still shedding tears. I wonder if it is longing for its sister or for the sun. The next one is entitled, Rest Your Horns. The wind is a raging bull tonight saddled with stabs, running everywhere. The sky howls, all doors are shut, everyone is asleep except me. I stand and wait for it. I wave my heart and say, rest your horns right here so we can bleed together. Days like this, this is kind of a circular poem. Of the desire often felt on days like this to abandon this shape of being and become a cloud, a tree, or a poem. To liquefy the eye, evaporate into a cloud that would roam, but eventually perform its end by kissing the million lips of a tree, the very last tree of what once was a forest. Someone is there gazing at the tree and thinking of the desire often felt on days like this. The next one I'll read in Arabic, it's called Dismemberment. I'll read in Arabic first and then in English. Tafakkuk. <clears throat> قال الجسد أو صوت ينتحل هويته اذهبوا فأنتم منذ الساعة أحرار طارت العينان بعيدا والتحقتا بأسراب العيون التي ملأت السماء وكادت تحجب ضوء الشمس الشفتان افترقتا بلا وداع واحدة تبحث عن وجه جديد 
والأخرى عن شفة تصغي إلى شكواها أخذ اللسان المتعب يفتش عن فم رجل أخرس يرتاح فيه صفقت اليدان ثم لوحتا لبعضهما البعض وهما تبتعدان بدت الساق اليمنى خائفة ومترددة ثم سارعت لتلحق بالأخرى سقط الأنف على الأرض وهكذا أما القلب فقد ظل وحيدا ينبض حتى دعسته قرئة في الظلام The body or a voice impersonating it said Go, as of now you are all free The eyes flew far away joining flocks of other eyes which had filled the sky almost blocking the sunlight The lips parted company without a farewell One search for a new face, the other for a lip that would listen to its complaints. The tired tongue sought a mute man's mouth to rest in. The hands clapped and waved to each other as they went away. The right leg appeared to be frightened and hesitant. Then it rushed to catch up with the left leg. The nose fell on the ground and so on and so forth. As for the heart, it kept beating alone until a lost foot crushed it. Yes, things are going to get a bit gory now, <laughs> but we'll get better towards the end. Ahead, I was not a tree or a sheep, but they muttered a few words and chopped my head off with a dull knife. It rolled far and I saw myself kneeling, hands tied behind my back, The fountain of blood died a few seconds later, and they went away without looking back. Hours later, hungry dogs came, sniffing. Take your share and leave nothing of my body, I said. I begged them, please leave my head here in the pit of this poem. Uh, the next one. There was a, uh, one of the many, many, sadly, many, many bombings that started to take place in Iraq after 2003 took place in a street called Al Mutanabi Street, which is kind of the heart of uh, the cultural scene in Baghdad, where booksellers, used booksellers and new booksellers, and especially every Friday, everyone goes there. So there were a number of uh, initiatives to commemorate that, and I was asked. And I wrote a poem called A Letter to Al Mutanabi. And the name is after a very famous, one of the most famous uh, poets in the Arabic language from the 10th century. A Letter to Al Mutanabi. You were right. Your words are still wings of light, always carrying you to us, sometimes carrying us to you. And your name is a green tattoo on Baghdad's tired face. Your street, a forehead of a body beheaded every morning. It's just another chapter in the saga of blood and ink you knew so well. I cannot lie to you. I am quite pessimistic. We are still etching on the walls of this cave, which is thousands of years long, signs we keep reinterpreting, and myths about a future world where we don't devour one another, where the sun is friendly and the seas cannot inherit our fever. Some of us are digging a deeper grave, about to embrace us all. They too have engravings, maps, philosophers, and books. We can only keep dreaming of a shore for the wind and dig wells in the dark with nails of silence and solitude. We will weave an ocean out of ink for our myths, and out of words, a sail or a shroud, vast enough for us all. Every book is a well around which we sit and drink to your health and try to live like you did with death and after it. Next one is called a photograph of an Iraqi boy on the front page of the New York Times. So it gives it away. He sat at the edge of the truck, eight or nine years old, surrounded by his family. 
His father, mother, and five siblings were asleep. His head was buried in his hands. All the clouds of the world were waiting on the threshold of his eyes. The tall man wiped off the sweat and started digging the seventh grave. One night in many cities, we leaned on the trunk of a palm tree, which has been burning for years, yet its shadow insists on keeping us company, even on cold nights. Franz waved farewell through the windows of an old song about the river, before its waves suffocated with corpses. The song drowns in the river, and we sit on a third bank everywhere, watching. There is enough wine tonight for the ghosts of the dead who just joined our table. Tomorrow, we must take their corpses out of the song and shroud them with words. Uh, heard on New Year's Eve, conversations overheard on New Year's Eve, one war to another. May you never tire, and may we go on forever. One book to its neighbor, hoping someone will remember us, and their fingers will touch our leaves to rouse us from this dust, even if for just a minute. One tree to another. I hope we stay together, and if a saw were to break our backs, may our remains stay close, perhaps two chairs around an elegant table, one cloud to another. Are you tired of traveling? No worries, soon we'll sleep in the sea. A sea to itself. I am bored of these shores and of everyone on them. I wish I could become a cloud and fly far away. So no one and nothing is happy in this world, basically. <laughs> um, that dampness. The sky is so clear today, as if the gods in charge stayed up all night polishing it. Still, a fleeing cloud I had seen yesterday just sought refuge in the poem. It shut the door, drew the curtains, and claimed to be a cocoon. There is a river in my womb. Soon it will flap its wings and fly for a few seconds. Then its wings will flow. I selfishly asked, What's in it for me? It sighed and said right before vanishing, a poem wet with the memory of water. Um, a, this one is called A Handbag in Chinatown. I love Chinatown, but whenever I'm there, I think of the negative effects of globalization. <laughs> a Handbag in Chinatown. Green. Dangling like a tropical fruit, its shiny skin calls out. A hand reaches out, feels it, thinking of plucking it. The branch lowers its head. It is so far now from the fingers that stitched it, fingers that dangle now like dry branches, from a tiny body asleep on a mattress whose threads groan from exhaustion on the other side of this world. A butterfly in New York. I chased it so often in our Baghdad garden, but it would always fly away. Today, three decades later, in another continent, it perched on my shoulder. Blue like the sea's thoughts or the tears of a dying angel. Its wings, two leaves falling from heaven. But why now does it know that I no longer run after butterflies and just watch them in silence and that I live like a broken branch? Sorry, I should... The next one is called, I don't visit my mother. I don't visit my mother that often. Her house is at the end of the world, 
always cold, even in Baghdad summer. The last time I visited her, she didn't say much. Silence was a stone still weighing heavily on me. Even her neighbors were silent. They stared at me, eyes shut. The wind murmured something I couldn't understand. And then the guard at the cemetery extended his hand and said, may she rest in peace. Um, crossing, I was at El Paso airport um, a long time ago. Actually crossing to Mexico to go for a, a poetry reading and I saw the uh, Soldiers, and uh, there's always, I don't know, it's a complicated moment when you see soldiers going, you know that they're going to war and kill other people in other countries, and you know that they're the victims of the machine here and the class war and all of that, but still, so. Um, here at El Paso Airport, I wait for Valentina, who will take me to the other side to read poems like this one in Juarez. Valentina is late. Soldiers are standing in line, laughing, teasing one another. I was going to write like hyenas about to smell their prey, but I shouldn't dehumanize them, right? They are peaceful now, waiting. Their uniforms the color of desert stained sand. Their boots are clean and ready to step on the sand of faces far away. There, where other men and women stand in a long line waiting for death. Um, phosphorus. When I was a kid, the tail end of my bike had a red reflector. It glowed in the dark like the eyes of a cat illuminated by the headlights of distant cars tiny bits of phosphorus, tiny bits of phosphorus, white phosphorus, illuminated the skies of Fallujah 11 years ago, and now infants are born there with two heads or without eyes. Autumn in heaven, trees are evergreen, Gentle winds tickle their branches. The elders read newspapers. Children play. Their mothers watching. There are whispers that another angel committed suicide last night. Uh, Eve's Confession. I now realize it's probably influenced by that poem I translated by Sargon Bolas, but anyway. I was the wind's voice, and when it grew tired, I dismounted its ribs and left it crying for me everywhere. I walked on water for a thousand years, then created myself on the earth's skin. And when I was bored, I made Adam. God was just a game we played. Um, when the uprising started in Syria, um, many, many of us, of course, were very moved and were uh, hopeful about what would happen. Um, so those poems were written in those days. One's called Nostalgia for Light. Place your right or left ear to the ground and listen. Do you hear moons choking on dirt? Trees gasp, extend their roots to kiss the foreheads of the new dead. Branches shiver, and the wind has nothing to say now. Night is morning, but other lips will rise tomorrow to repeat the same words and kiss the sun. Every sleeping tear will wake up and look for her sisters to become a river. Every voice will rise from its grave, looking for a throat to build a nest for a chant. Every word dreams of standing in that sentence, 
we use to plow the sky and plant a new sun the people want. Martyrs do not go to paradise. Its gates have been shut for centuries. The merchants who bought its rivers look down from the lofty balconies at the long lines of homeless crowds waiting outside. Martyrs do not go to paradise. They leave through the heavenly book, each in their own way, as a bird, a star, or a cloud. They appear to us every day and cry for us, we, who are still in a hell they try to extinguish with their blood. Wars. <clears throat> when I was torn by war, I took a brush, immersed in death, and drew a window on the wall of this war. I opened it, searching for something, but all I saw was another war and a mother weaving a shroud for the dead man still in her womb. Sorry, I wanna... And now after subjecting you to all this, um, a few short poems, delving. <clears throat> the sea is a lexicon of blueness, assiduously read by the sun. Your body too is a lexicon of my desires. Its first letter will take a lifetime. Your lips are a pink butterfly flying from one word to another. I run after them in gardens of silence. Sifting. My eyes are two sieves sifting in piles of others for you. So this is obviously, I was hoping that it's a love poem and interestingly enough, the the book was reviewed by a reviewer, and he had happened. He was a, a soldier who fought in Iraq, and he said that he could really identify with this poem because when he's at the checkpoint, and he's looking at people and thinking, "Who's going to be?" Yes. Yeah, so, just a reminder that <laughs> that things don't work, <laughs> or that no, we don't see eye to eye on this on this. Um, all right. This one is called simply a word. It drives me insane. It's hate, it hates dictionaries and mocks them. It dodges all sentences and wants to run alone and swim in silence. It prefers to swing on the lips of a madman or hide in a whisper instead of being with its peers. I begged it to calm down and sit still for just a moment to smile and hug its neighbors for the sake of the poem. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, one poem called, I will read it in Arabic also before the English. It's called Three Lilies. Thalathu Zanabiq. Thalathu Zanabiq am Thalathu Ummahat. Thalathu Zanabiq. Al Ula Tafatahat. Kaanna Batlatiha al Bayda Tatadarrao. Tesalu Ilahan ma an Auladiha. A Thaniya Tun Hanat. Yakadu Dahruha Yan Kasiru. إذ تبحث في الأرض عن ميسمها الثالثة ما زالت تخبئ وجهها تحت وجهها وتبكي أتراها تعرف ثلاث زنابق مقطوعة السيقان والماء نزر في أصيص زجاجي ووراء زجاج الشاشة ثلاث أمهات سوريات Three lilies 
The first has bloomed, its white petals beseech some god, inquiring about their children. The second is bent, its back almost broken, searching for its stigma on the ground. The third is hiding its face behind its face and is crying. Does it know? Three lilies, stems severed. There is barely any water in the vase. And on the screen behind, there are three Syrian mothers. Another one that I will read both in Arabic and English. في حياتي القادمة في حياتي القادمة لن أكون أنا سأكون زهرة برية تستلقي على سفح تل بعيد تستريح عليها الفراشات وقد يقطفها طفل لا يعرف الحروب يأخذها إلى أمه يضعها بين نهديها تقبله تشمني وأشمها في حياتي القادمة لن أكون In my next life in my next life, I will not be I. I will be a wild flower lying on the slope of a distant hill. Butterflies rest on it. It might be plucked by a child who knows no wars. He takes it to his mother, puts it between her breasts. She kisses him. She smells me. I smell her. In my next life, I will not be. And because we are near the, um, well, before I, I was going to end with a, with a wine song, because we're in the wine country. <laughs> but I will read one more called Psalm. In the beginning, there was a stab. The dagger created the wound in its image, then went away looking for another body. The wound cried for 40 days, then healed itself, and it became a heart and started to crawl, searching for another body. Now, Wine Song is dedicated to my dear friends and companions, <laughs> uh, Maliha and Shahram. One of them is here, I think, at least. The uh, wines, uh, wine poetry is very extensive in Arabic and Persian. So actually, thousands and thousands of amazing poems are written. So it becomes very difficult to uh, try to write something that sounds new. And that's my attempt. Wine song. The tears of a cloud after losing her sisters. The sun's red cheeks as it gazes at its own nudity. The wind's whispers to the vines, its secrets as it rests its head on the earth's shoulder. The wavering of a red butterfly around a lavender. The size of a goddess whose worshippers are extinct. The desire waiting in a widowed body. The sorrow of a shore when the sea ebbs. The joy of silk when it touches a breast. Two nipples fighting over a mouth, the howling of a blind wolf on a moonless night, the earth's gasps and the seeds of a thousand poems are all in this drop of red wine. <laughs> because I'm a red wine person. Yeah, and that's for 40 minutes exactly. So thank you so much for your patience. <laughs>